Terrific. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to today's seminar, Can Behavioral Science Reduce Crime? with renowned economist Jens Ludwig as the speaker. So this seminar is part of a series of seminars that's joint between the IIES and SNS. It's called the, the International Policy Talks, and it's a collaboration between Stockholm University and SNS to bring uh, insights from the leading international economists to the Swedish policy debate. So thank you very much for being here, and please continue attending other talks in the seminar. So during this seminar, Jens is going to present uh, a new report, uh, part of the SNS research project on crime and society. Uh, and then joining Jens, we'll have uh, a panelist with Gunilla Dobrin, Jenny Scherholm, and Ulrika Liljeberg, and I'll introduce them uh, during the panel discussion. Great. So without further ado, I'm uh, glad to introduce Jens Ludwig today. Um, hey. Sadly, that's all the Swedish I speak. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming. It's a real honor to be here, have a chance to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing in the United States context, especially in the city of Chicago, where I'm from. But I hope you'll see there will be some commonality with some of the work that is being done here in Sweden and some lessons, hopefully, for, for the Swedish context as well. So um, let's get right, uh, right into it. So um, just to set the stage where I'm coming from, um, if you sort of step back and look at one of the major public health accomplishments in the, as I think of violence as a public health problem, if you look at the, one of the major accomplishments of public health over the last 150 years, you can see it's the doubling of life expectancy around the world. Um, and we've done that through data and looking open-mindedly at the nature of all manner of causes of death. Um, and in contrast to this amazing progress that we've made in addressing most causes of mortality, there are just two exceptions, really, at least in the US context. One is cancer. Is cancer will kill us all if something else doesn't. Um, and interpersonal violence is the other exception, at least in the US context. So this shows you the murder rate from 1950 to 2020 in the US. You can see there's basically no long-term progress. I don't know what the data look like for Sweden. I'd be surprised if Sweden was very different. If I showed you this graph going all the way back to 1900, you'd see exactly the same thing. So every other cause of death is plummeting over time, except for cancer and for, for murder, basically. OK. Um, now, why have we not made more progress on the problem of lethal interpersonal violence? And what I want to. Uh, show you is how most Americans think about the problem. And my guess is going to be that this will have echoes of how people in Sweden think about the problem as well. So this is a survey that was done in 1994 of uh, Americans at the time that President Bill Clinton signed the most important crime law in, uh, in the United States history. Shows you what Americans were thinking about uh, what causes crime at the time. And what you'll see here is, um, so look at the 1994 line. Why is there so much crime in the US context? Um, something like 70% of Americans said some combination of the criminal justice system is not harsh enough to scare people away from committing crime. Uh, people have the wrong personal values and drug use, which most Americans view as a personal failing. So if you look at the survey, what you'll see is Basically, seven out of 10 Americans thought the crime problem is caused by characterologically bad people, something wrong with the people themselves, their morality, whatever it is. And to the extent to which there's any alternative view about what causes crime in the US context, you'll see it's a small share of people who think the problem basically is bad social conditions, poverty, segregation, bad schools, and so on. My guess is that in the Swedish context, the relative shares of those two explanations might be shifted a little bit. But most people in most developed countries think that crime is due to one of those two explanations. Okay, um, just a different proportions. Okay, now notice what those two explanations have in common, right? So the the perspective that uh, that crime is caused by characterologically immoral people who are not afraid of the criminal justice system and the sanctions that it might impose. That's a story about people being insufficiently deterred by the criminal justice system, right? And the solution is to increase the sticks of the criminal justice system so there's more deterrence. The perspective from the left of center 
um, on the political distribution says people are committing crime because they don't have sufficient legal opportunities to make it in society. And the solution is to improve their legal earnings opportunities and jobs and schooling opportunities and so on. That also is a story of incentives in some ways. We need to improve the alternatives to crime when people are making these choices. So both the left and the right implicitly view the problem of crime as one of deliberate, rational, benefit cost type calculation. Okay, so the left and the right think the solutions are different, but their implicit diagnosis is the same. It's just a matter of whether we focus on changing the carrots or the sticks. So they view crime as being the intentional product of deliberate choices that people are making, okay? And where has that line of thinking gotten us in the US context? Well, at the risk of immodesty, we've become world-class at locking people up. Um, this is a picture of the Cook County Jail a few miles from my office at the University of Chicago. Um, you can see that the United States has no international equal in terms of the rate at which we incarcerate people. Um, you can see that in the United States, the burden of incarceration has fallen very disproportionately on the most socially vulnerable people in the United States, which in the US is um, African American and Hispanic Americans. And you can also see that this has not made the United States the safety, even though we're uh, easily, we easily have the highest incarceration rate of any, any country in the world, we are not the safest country in the world by a long shot. In fact, we're the most dangerous rich country in the world. You can see our murder rate is off the charts compared to any other rich country in the world. Well, I guess you, uh, you can barely see the country map in the background. And you can see, especially for the most vulnerable populations in the US that are experiencing incarceration the most, you can see our, uh, our murder rate for black Americans uh, has no comparable rate uh, in any part of the developed world. Okay. So uh, a final sort of indication for how things are going is a few years ago in the United States, an organization at the University of Colorado got a grant from the US Department of Justice to review all of the crime prevention and rehabilitation programs that have been carried out in the US. So it was something like 600 studies total. And um, these are programs that are based on conventional wisdom, either the conventional wisdom of the, the left or the conventional wisdom of the right to prevent crime, prevent recidivism. And they, uh, uh, the review found that of the 600 programs, about 30 seem to work. So if you're from the University of Stockholm or you remember your statistics class uh, for statistical significance, if you look at 600 studies and you find that 5% of them seem to work, that is about as many studies as you would find to work if nothing worked in a world in which you're willing to tolerate a 5% false positive rate. So things are not going well. Things are not going well under the conventional wisdom. That's the, that's the key point. Okay. Um, so it seems to me like against this backdrop of no long-term progress, the specific diagnoses that we have of the problem are not leading to solution. So it's not like we know what to do when we just haven't put lots of money into it. That's the point that I wanted to make with that last slide. So we need a different way of thinking about the problem. And so what I wanted to do is um, illustrate this different way of thinking um, with a little audience participation game. I've, I've, this works great in the United States. We'll see how this works in the Scandinavian context. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, uh, this is only going to work if the audience, if you're all actually involved. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, um, uh, an object in the middle of the slide, and I want you to call out the color of the object in the middle of the slide. And do it in Swedish, because I think this will be easier for, for most of you. Okay, I have no idea what you're saying, but you'll know what you're saying. All right, we'll just do a practice one for starters. Okay, ready? Oh, wait a second, sorry. Before we get there, before we get there. Sorry, false alarm, false alarm. Um, let me do a little bit more setup before we do the audience participation game. But now you're prepped, you're ready. You're, the suspense is building. Okay, so the, I forgot. There's, there's one other step that I wanna, I wanna do before I talk you through the audience participation game, which is, I think, the first pivot in our thinking about the, the cause of the violence problem. And that is that the violence problem, I think, is different from what you, what you think it is, at least in the US context, okay? So in the US context, 
the media portrayal of the problem and entertainment portrayal is overwhelmingly dominated by news accounts of organized criminal gangs that are fighting over drug selling turf. That's basically what dominates the news headlines all the time, okay? Um, I'm from the city of Chicago. We have, uh, we are either number one or number two in the United States in terms of our gang problem. It's Los Angeles and Chicago, and then everybody else is a distant third. Okay, so I'm coming from the gang central of the United States, maybe the gang central of the world. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, with that said, this is what most gun violence in America looks like. So this is a more or less randomly selected example um, of a shooting from the Chicago Tribune, our, our local newspaper. This happened about two miles from my office at the University of Chicago in the South Shore neighborhood on the South Side. June 2nd, 2012 was a Saturday. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. There are two groups of kids in the middle of the street, crowded street, arguing about whether someone in one of the groups had stolen a bike from a kid in one of the other groups, okay? So on the south side of Chicago, if you go to Craigslist or Etsy or some other sort of website, you will see that the resale value of a crummy used bike on the south side is something like 10 or 20 bucks. So it's very hard. It's true that everybody involved was poor, but it's very hard to imagine that economic motivations really explain what happened next, okay? And the other thing that you could see is that the two groups of kids were starting to separate, so there's no self-defense rationale for what happens next, which is some 17-year-old kid in one of the groups pulls a handgun out of their waistband, of which we have something like 400 million in the United States for a country of 330 million, which contributes to the problem, pulls a semi-automatic handgun out of his waistband, fires into the other group, hits a 16-year-old kid uh, in the chest named Jamal Lockett, who's raised to the emergency room where he's, uh, where he's pronounced dead. That is the gun violence problem in America, okay? Some of the kids in the two groups were involved in gangs, but it was not motivated by a gang war over drug selling turf. It was an argument over something as small as a used bike, okay? And so this then reframes the puzzle that we have to solve. Like, how do we make sense of a kid shooting another kid over a $10 used bike, okay? Um, and so as you can see, this is from a city, this is from, this is Chicago data. You can see even in the most gang ridden city in the United States, the overwhelming majority of murders in the US are driven by altercations. Just a small share, something like only one in five of murders in Chicago are driven by gang wars over drug selling turf, okay? And so we don't have a crime, we don't have a, a crime problem or a violence problem. We have a arguments with weapons problem in the US and arguments with, with guns problem. And you can see most of these arguments, most of these shoot, fatal shootings that we have in the US start with words. They in principle could have been de-escalated by either party at multiple stages of this interaction. They weren't de-escalated and then it winds up in a tragedy because somebody winds up having a gun or some other lethal weapon at hand. That's the problem to be solved. Okay, now we can think about the audience participation. So the audience participation game now is about trying to understand this puzzle. Why does this happen? And we can't think about policies to undo this if we don't understand why it's happening. Okay, so now we can do our practice run. So here we go. Is, it, is that actually the Swiss? Yeah. That is, okay, all right. I have no way to check your work. But you can do much, much better than that. We are not at the Harvard Faculty Club here. This is, an, this is an engaged audience, an intellectual audience. It's only gonna work if people are really, really actively engaged, okay? So here we go. It's, it's really only gonna work if everybody's involved in this. All right, here we go. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Everybody's gotta do it. All right, here we go. So is this actually the Swedish word for blue? Oh, good. I, I'm so incompetent, I wasn't sure I could use Google Translate correctly. So um, when I do this in the United States context, that's the last word. And if you've taken a psychology class, you'll recognize this as the Stroop test. I'll explain what this... Um, the CIA in the US used to use the Stroop context uh, to screen out Russian spies as part of the... And they would do the Stroop context 
where this would be the last part. OK, so what is it? Very interesting and, and appropriate for the time, isn't it? Um, so what is this group, this group test illustrating? Um, so many of you here have written, uh, have read the, the amazing book that Danny Kahneman wrote called Thinking Fast and Slow. If you haven't read it, skip the rest of this talk, run to the local bookstore, get the Swedish translation of Thinking Fast and Slow and read it. It's, it's a life-changing book. Uh, it'll change your thinking about public policy problems and also change your thinking about yourself as well. It'll help you understand yourself and your own cognition in a, in a life-changing way. At least it was life-changing for me as well. So the key argument for thinking fast and slow is that our minds actually have two ways of, of thinking, and we are only aware of one of them. Okay, so the type of thinking that we are all aware of is deliberate conscious thinking. This is like the voice in our head. So Kahneman and other psychologists call that system two, okay? And that's deliberate and effortful and mentally taxing. And because it's mentally taxing, the brain is designed, it's, it uses a lot of mental energy to deliberately think. And because it uses a lot of mental energy, our mind is designed to, to do as little of that as possible. So what we do instead is we rely on the other type of cognition that the, the mind uses uh, that Kahneman calls system one, which is automatic cognition that happens below the level of consciousness. So we all develop a series of automatic system one responses that work well for situations that we see over and over again in daily life, okay? Um, and they normally work well, but they can get us into trouble when we come across an out of the ordinary situation. And that's what this group test is supposed to illustrate, okay? So what is the situation that we see over and over again in daily life? We see a word. Imagine how exhausting life would be if every time you saw a text somewhere, you're driving down the road, there's a street sign, there's a, a billboard for Burger King, whatever it is, one of these great American cultural exports, and you had to deliberately think through whether you should read the sign or not. Your life would be exhausting. So you've developed this automatic below the level of consciousness response, see text, read text, okay? And that works great, right? That works great for most of the situations that you see all the time. The Stroop test creates a very unusual out of the ordinary situation that pits the task that you're supposed to do against this automatic system one response that you're not even aware of. So the task is to call out the color. You cannot help yourself from saying whatever the Swedish word for blue is because of that system one response, it overrides it. Okay, so you're thinking, this is very interesting. I'm impressed that Jens actually does know how to use Google Translate. What does this have to do with interpersonal violence? Okay. Um, so. Unfortunately, we know in the US context, I will have a conversation about the degree to which this translates to the Swedish context as well, but unfortunately we know in the US context that in many, many under-resourced neighborhoods where the violence is, is most concentrated, the sources of what criminologists call social control. So these are formal sources of social control like teachers, sports coaches, police officers, social workers, and informal social control as well, like shopkeepers, neighbors, male people, whatever, who might be able to step in and, and help navigate trouble when it happens, those sources of formal social control and informal social control are overwhelmed. So kids learn that they're basically on their own to navigate daily life and keep themselves safe. So if you are a kid in most of the South Side of Chicago and you're walking to school, and some kid, other kid comes up to you and challenges you and demands that you hand over your lunch money, okay? You know in that neighborhood that you can't go to any nearby adult for help because they will say, in this neighborhood, we're worried about gun violence, we're not worried about stolen lunch money, so get lost. So you know that nobody's gonna help you, no local adults are gonna help you, you, and you also know that if you give over your lunch money today, you have signaled to everyone else in the neighborhood that you're an easy victim. To give over your lunch money today is to invite being challenged for your phone tomorrow 
and to invite being challenged for your winter coat the day after and to invite being challenged for your bicycle the day after that, okay? So what do kids in these environments learn? They develop an automatic system one response that is adaptive. It makes sense for the neighborhood environment in which they're in. I get challenged, I fight back hard. And because I am not fighting back as retribution for the past challenge, I am fighting back as a signal to ward off future challenges. So the ferocity with which I fight back need in no way be proportional to the level of provocation because I'm sending a message, I'm not retaliating for what you just did. And the fiercer the pushback, the better the retaliation and deterrence I've just created. That can work really, really well for kids who have to navigate these unfortunate social environments, but can get you into trouble when someone's got a gun in their waistband. You can see fight back really hard, no matter the level of provocation, works well when we're punching each other, leads to tragedy when you have a semi-automatic handgun in your waistband, okay? And um, so here's what I wanna leave you with, right? This gives us a radical reorientation in our thinking about what's driving. It is not always deliberate rational system to benefit cost calculation that is giving rise to this violence. It is often system one responses that normally work well for us that get us into trouble when we're in out of the ordinary novel, really high stakes situations. The good news is that, and we'll hear about some Swedish versions of programs like this as well. The good news is that frontline practitioners have on their own discovered very clever ways of engaging young people and helping them recognize in different ways these system one responses. And so I'll, in the interest of time, I won't get into what these programs look like, but I'm happy to do that during Q&A. But in Chicago, one example of a program like this that helps kids recognize their system one responses and when to be more system two in high stakes situations, there's a program called uh, Becoming a Man that was invented by a Chicago nonprofit called Youth Guidance. We did, uh, two large randomized control trials with several thousand kids on the south and west sides of Chicago where the gun violence is concentrated. And we found something like 40 to 50% reductions in violence. These programs do not threaten people with harsher punishments, right? They do not teach morality and they don't solve big structural root causes. They don't end poverty. They don't end segregation. They don't end discrimination or social isolation. They literally just help people be a little bit more system two, a little less system one in high stakes situations. And they cut violence and vi This is from something like 10 to 20 hours of program participation, you can cut violence involvement in half. So you might say, maybe this is just dumb luck. Maybe it's unique to this particular program. It is not unique to this program. It is a function of the underlying logic of the decision-making and what's going on here. And so as a way to show you that, we did a version of Becoming a Man. This is the juvenile detention center on the west side of Chicago. And we worked with the staff, the detention staff, to implement a version of Becoming a Man. It wasn't exactly the same, but based on the same principles. These are the highest risk kids in Chicago. And you can see a statistically, this is also structured like a randomized control trial big statistically significant reduction in recidivism rates for a dirt cheap behavioral science program, right? Um, so here's sort of the, the punchline to all of this for, uh, for me. So if you step back, you look, most of the programs motivated by conventional wisdom don't work. You look at the long-term history of the, the problem itself, no long-term progress. It's easy to look at this and say, this is an unsolvable problem, okay? But once you understand what it really is, most of what we've been trying has been focused on system two. The radical reorientation is let's think of, and there are lots of ways of targeting system one with policies, right? That can be very, very preventive, less crime and less incarceration at the same time. So lots of exciting, I think, important opportunities here. The key idea that I want you to walk away with was summarized, we were in the juvenile detention center on the west side of Chicago. This is the last thing I'll say, Simon, then we'll start the panel. But um, we're on the west side of, uh, of Chicago in the, in the detention center, and I'm talking to a staff member. And he says, you know, 20% of the kids in here are genuinely dangerous. You let them out. They're, these are the psychopaths, the sociopaths. They will really genuinely do. So we do need a criminal justice system. 
right? There really are psychopaths in the world. It would be crazy to close down all of the jails and the prisons. That's about 20% of the kids in here in, in this person's estimation. But he says, the other 80%, I always tell them, if I could give you back just 10 minutes of your lives, none of you would be here. Okay, and so the reorientation is, yes, there are bad people. Yes, there are bad social conditions. But there are also bad decisions that people make in very, very time-limited windows that we can do something about and have really, really disproportionate impacts on this incredibly important and regressive public health and public policy problem. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to have five minutes of uh, questions from me, from the audience. You don't want to hear too much from me. So please raise your hand, and uh, the microphones will come from you. In the meantime, Yins, let me just ask you, you know, clearly we're trying to change the way people think. Do, do raise your hand. The microphone takes time to get there. Uh, you know, you're talking about changing the way people think. What's, what's the right point to intervene in that process? You have some experiments once they're in jail. You have some experiments when they're in school, when they're young in school, when they're a little bit older. What do we know about kind of the right point to intervene in the lives of these young people to kind of prevent these problems? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that you can, um, so what I would say is continuously. I, I feel like that's a little bit of a pun, but the way that we, the way that the intervention looks is different. So. Um, many of you have probably read different papers or seen summaries of papers by my University of Chicago colleague, Jim Heckman, who for the last 10 or 20 years has been writing about the incredible importance of early childhood interventions. And there's a number of uh, randomized experiments of early childhood programs that now track people up into adulthood, deep into adulthood, 40, 50, age 60. And we can see really, really big uh, lifetime changes in criminal involvement, including violence, caused by participating at age three or four, right? And so, you know, the most intuitive way, going back to con connecting that to conventional wisdom, the most intuitive way to think about why those programs are generating lifetime changes in, in criminality is because they're raising people's earnings. But earnings don't affect your, like, I've, I've just argued that Arguments are not about income. And the way that those early childhood programs are working is they are basically teaching kids how to navigate conflict and navigate. Inter this is what, if you have a kid, you see, this is what a lot of early childhood is about, is you're no longer you know, just one kid with your parents. You're in a class of 20 kids, and you have to learn to get along. And that's one of the. Now, the, the reason that I say continuously intervene is no, even the most effective early childhood program is not perfectly protective. And if you have ever seen, I wish I had this sort of, you'll just have to see me use my finger instead. Uh, there's something called the age crime curve that shows that um, serious criminality is, is almost non-existent before the ages of 12 or 13 in most countries and really spikes, it peaks in late adolescence, early 20s, and then steadily declines over the adult life course. And the most common finding of all social programs is fade out, right? Even with effective early childhood programs, they're not as, they have a bigger impact at age five than they do at age 15, age 25, whatever. And so we need to be complementing early childhood programs with interventions that are also targeted on late adolescence and early adulthood, because in a world of fade out, we need interventions that are approximate to the life stage where the serious violence is, is most happening. And, and the reason that I say that is because it's tempting to look at the amazing impact of these early childhood programs and think, let's only do that, right? And the other reason I think it's so easy for people to, to think that is little kids make a very, very sympathetic, in a world in which we don't have enough money to do everything, little kids make an amazingly sympathetic program population. Three and four-year-old kids are adorable. <laughs> 17-year-old kids who are in gangs are less adorable to most government officials, voters, even philanthropists, right? These are kids who use bad language. These are kids who are, aren't always like interacting with the way that foundation heads and government agencies want. They've got ten, whatever, whatever, right? And, and our experience has been much, much harder to get government money and foundation money to help teenagers covered with tattoos who are saying all sorts of swear words than three and four year old kids, but the teenagers need as much help as the as the cute little kids as well.
Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Hi. Hi. There, there will be more questions for, or more time for questions yeah. uh, later. Uh, Stephanie Luthman from the National Crime Bureau. Uh, Jens, I just wanted to quickly ask you about the program. Is it meant for the perpetrators alone or even for the victims? It's a, it's a great question. What, what I would, um, uh, what I would argue is that maybe perpetrator and victim. So five years ago, I was robbed at gunpoint in Chicago, picking up my daughter from her piano lesson for that robbery victim perpetrator is a division that makes perfect sense. Okay. But for the, the bicycle argument on the South side of Chicago, I think the victim perpetrator frame becomes much more complicated, right? Because I say, where's my bike, right? And you have a very easy out. When I say, where's my bike? You say, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. I don't have it. Now, if instead you say, so that would be one branch of the tree. I'm so sorry. I don't have your bike. It's a misunderstanding. Instead, if you say, fuck you. Now, eventually, who's the victim and who's the perpetrator there depends on who gets to their gun in the waistband first, right? But the good news is, and you can see that in the Chicago data, right? 90% of homicide offenders in Chicago have a prior criminal record, but so do 80% of homicide victims, right? Very, very strongly overlapping offender and, and victim populations because a lot of this is driven by this sort of back and forth. But there's good news in that too, right? So I don't think about it as for the victims or for the offenders. I think about it for all these kids. The good news is in a world in which either party in a robbery, like I did, like what did I do? Like the guy puts a gun in my face. I'm like, here's my phone, here's my wallet, here are my car keys. Just please don't shoot me in the head in front of my kid, right? But so the only way you could change that event is to change that person's behavior, not mine. But if it's a back and forth, the good news is that both of us have an off ramp, right? Both of us have an off ramp. So I only need one of the two parties to think it's just not worth it. I'm going to de-escalate this, right? And so I think that is kind of also an exciting mindset shift here is that we don't need to be locked into victim offender framework or terminology or something. Great. That's very helpful. We're going to switch over to the panel. Okay. So and should, I sit? should I stay? Should I? Uh, yeah, sit. Okay. Sit. Okay. Sit. 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 Please. Okay. Thank you. You'll be back. Don't worry. Uh, so. We're going to switch over to the panel. First, we're going to hear from uh, Ulrika Liljeberg. Uh, Ulrika represents the Center Party as a member of the Parliamentary Committee on Justice, as well as the legal policy spokesperson. Uh, she has an educational background in the fields of law and economics, and she's previously served for 14 years as the mayor of Lexan. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm trying. Uh, before that, she had a career in law, uh, among other things, serving as a public prosecutor in Falun, and we're very excited to hear what Ulrika has to say. Please. We were told we were all going up, no? Uh, they're, no. they're next. They're next, so, okay. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you're next. Uh, Watch out, Katie. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, and nice to finally see all of you. I am also, uh, you didn't say that, the substitute. Yeah, uh, the minister uh, canceled yesterday uh, due to something else, and I'm here, so uh, excuse me for if I'm not that well prepared. Uh, well, I did have the chance to read the, uh, the study. Thank you for that. And what hit me and realized is that this also applies for politicians. We also have uh, automatic responses. Uh, we should also spend more time on decision making uh, because I think this is uh, just human behavior for all of us. Uh, we do, I'm from the Liberal Party, the Center Party of Sweden. Uh, I often, uh, I have my automatic response is always, uh, oh, we think of the, the individual and not the race and not the uh, religion and person and so. And, and my colleagues, they all have their responses. So I was asked to, to uh, 
since you are a lot of researchers here, you're a lot of uh, you work at uh, different agencies. So uh, also to to see what I can tell you, what we need as politicians, and I would say that um, I want you to remind us that things are possible to change because we often come with all our automatic response, and I. I I said that when we get challenged, we also push back. We do that. Uh, so I think that you need to tell us that this isn't possible to change, that we can do this. Uh, and since I'm the only politician, I, I try not to be too focused on my party, but to represent all of the politicians. So a couple of weeks ago, the Justitut Scott, the, the, the Committee of Justice, we were in the USA to, to uh, look into crimes and crime reduction. And so we went to New York and to New Jersey. We visited uh, the NYPD and the DEA and the local police area in Bronx. And uh, we were, I think many of us, um, we were inspired how uh, they actually worked on reducing crime more than prosecution and sending people to jail, even though uh, they you do in the US have a large population in jail. But it, there was a different focus from what I think many of us see here now, to decrease, to prevent. Uh, and uh, I think that is what we can learn from this study and, and uh, also that you that all many of you work towards those politicians to do that. Thank you. And you'll have more uh, opportunities to ask Ulrika questions in a few minutes. But now let me introduce uh, Yini Scherholm. Yini is the Director of Research and Development at the Swedish National Board of Institutional Care. She's previously held positions at the Swedish Agency for Technology Assessment and as Head of Research and Evaluation at the Swedish Prison and Probation Service. Yini? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I've spent most of my career trying to improve the welfare system to enhance the chance for those less fortunate in life to regain health and uh, return to a well-functioning life. And it gives me great hope to listen to Professor Ludwig's presentation. Motivation and functional strategies are key, I think, uh, to change for all of us. The results of the studies presented here aligns with core elements of the treatment programs that we offer the children placed under compulsory care at SIS, the National Board of Institutional Care. However, the programs that Professor Ludwig has talked about seem extremely efficient and provide a method simple enough to implement without requiring investments in expensive tools and instruments. So it really triggers my curiosity and willingness to discuss this further with my coworkers when I get back to the office. Reflecting upon the heading of today's seminar, Can Behavioral Science Reduce Crime? I wouldn't be a behavioral scientist or a social worker unless I believe people can change. And therefore, I also believe it's possible to prevent criminal behavior and reduce the risk of recidivism as well. But is it really uh, necessary to lock children up to achieve this? Locking up is a prerequisite for care and treatment sometimes. The children placed with us at SIS come from an environment where everything else has failed and where they lack motivation for any open source of care or treatment. And locking them up is essential to reach out and give them incentives to accept the care and treatment they need. The aim for our agency is to regain a social, to help these kids regain a socially functional life in an open setting. These kids are traumatized and they have many special needs, such as health care, psychiatric care, dental care and education, to mention some. It's necessary to work with stabilizing measures, such as structure for sleeping, eating and daily activities at first, in order to make the children receptive to other interventions. Important to say is that the purpose is not to finalize their treatment as is, but to help them become functional and motivated to continue treatment in an open setting. And I tell you this because I feel that it's often misunderstood in the debate or the discussion uh, that you, these children are treated and they will leave cis uh, fully treated and uh, have a normal life after that. So I think it is, it's very important to remember that. 
And what CIS needs then from policymakers in order to meet the challenges that we're facing and to be more efficient is that we need means and resources to conduct scientific effect evaluations. We need proper legislation, expedient facilities, competent personnel, health care and dental care that meet our children's and clients' needs. And this is what we have put forward to the government and that they have now included in the assignment directive for the government investigation that Lisa Tam will be conducting. So if politicians or policymakers want to have an evidence-based practice for institutional care in the future, it's absolutely crucial to give CIS the legal tools to conduct scientific effect evaluations, just like they've done for the prison and probation service and for the forensic medicine agency. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And, uh, and finally, we'll hear from uh, Gunilla Dubrin. Gunilla is uh, experienced with work in, uh, with children and youth therapy and is the founder and developer of the method Repulse. Repulse draws on fields such as cognitive psychotherapy and development theory and is used for youth age five and up, uh, struggling with emotion regulation and impulse control. Uh, and since the 1990s, the method has been developed and it's now widely used in social services, school, as well as institutional care. Gunilla? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, I want to um, apologize for my bad English, but I hope you, you know what I mean anyway, because I, I want to um, go back to um, uh, Jens Ludwig's, um, what he said uh, in the, the script there. A staff member said, if I could give you back just 10 minutes of your life, you wouldn't be here. And the kids that I worked with, the young kids, juveniles, they told me, if I had learned what you have learned me when I was younger, I wouldn't ever, ever, ever ended up here. And that's why I um, convinced that Repulse fits good together with your um, BAM model. Because there's a several, several similarities between BAM and Repulse, such as both methods are low-cost methods. Focus on managing thoughts, feeling, and behavior with a focus on impulse control, manager, ma maturity development, and social skills. There are some, um, there are some differences in the methods. One is that Repulse was developed to be used individually because each person has their own unique connection between thoughts, feeling, and behavior. My experience from developing Repulse was that many young people experienced it, that no one asked them how it was. Another, another thing is that Repulse also catch up those people who have too much impulse control, where the result can be very violent acts, like school shooting, for example. The participants in BAM is boys between 15 and 18 years. In Repulse, we start already at five and up, regardless of sex and gender. And the program form is in BAM is group. In Repulse, it's both individual, school classes, and parent groups, because parents often said, this I should have learned too when I was younger. So, um, yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much, Audrey. Thank you. Uh, so, the audience will now have opportunities. Jens, why don't you come back up? The audience will now have uh, opportunities to ask any of the panelists any questions, uh, particularly as it relates to the evidence that Jens presented or to Swedish policy debates uh, around these issues. So just raise your hand and a microphone will descend upon you. Magically. In the meantime, uh, you know, let me ask, particularly with uh, Jens up here talking about the importance of evidence-based practice and Gunilla having developed your own program, how should policymakers think about the balance between, you know, we all want to follow the evidence, we all want to do things that have been proven to work, but at the same time, if, if we are only ever following the evidence, we're never trying new things, we're never trying new programs, and we're never developing new approaches to kind of challenges as they change. 
And how should policymakers challenge or balance these two objectives? Yes. But I say we must listen to those who we want to help because they just want to be taken seriously. We cannot guess and do what we believe is the best. The youth don't care about if it's an evidence-based program or not. They just want help. Sometimes we are eager to try new things because we believe that new problems need new solutions. But we want to work based on evidence, long and proven experience. Repulse has been experienced since 1998, and it still is um, lots of people who want to learn how to work with this model. In Repulse, we have seen that young people's questions are not different from when Repulse was created. We have not fundamentally changed the method either. We know that impulse control is of great importance for the decision you make. Of about 2,500 people, 97% feel that they have better impulse control of the repulse courses. We think also that it's important to have quality control over the program, which we have by the working books, the free tutorial by, by mail and tele telephones and days where you can update your knowledge. Evolution from more than 7,500 7, participants you can see on our website. And, and Gids, please. Yeah, maybe the, the only quick thing that I would just add to that is I think the... Um, Critically important thing, is, you know, everything about reading, as I said, thinking, reading the professors, politicians, kids, everybody needs to better understand the way their minds work. I, I completely agree. The, many of the same challenges that lead us into trouble in our day-to-day, -day, you know, lives also make it very hard for us to see what is actually helpful out in the world because our minds are designed to see cause and effect relationships that are not really there in the world. And so I think the most important thing is to combine innovation with real, with real serious measurement about what's actually helpful. And let me just give one medical example as, as um, you know, for thousands of years, literally thousands of years of human existence, um, best practice treatment in medicine for almost everything was bleeding people. We had a very elaborate, well-developed theory of there are four humors in the body and illness is caused by the humors being out of balance. And so we need to either put leeches on people or literally cut people and drain a bunch of blood to reestablish equilibrium. Now, most illness self-resolves. I get a cold, I get a flu, I get better. People said, look, Mitch is sick. I put a bunch of leeches on him. A week later, he's better. Look at what a terrific job I'm doing. And we see the problem. And so that's an example. The flip side is think about one of the most transformative medical advances in, in human history was the invention of penicillin when the guy leaves the orange or whatever it is in his office for the weekend, goes on vacation, comes back, says, what is this fuzzy stuff that's killed though, whatever, whatever. So our intuition about what is really helpful is very, very imperfect. And we need to be continually pressure testing our intuition against the world to make sure that what we think is helpful is actually helpful. And it's only through that pressure testing of ideas that we're going to get progress. Thank you. If you could please introduce yourself and, and your affiliation. I will. I'm Linka Benson, the CEO of SNS. And thank you for a great presentation and also the discussion so far. Jens, I would just like, could, could you just describe in a few words uh, the BAM method as well, so we know what they do? Yeah, terrific. Thank you for asking the question. Let me, let me explain the very first exercise that the kids do in the Becoming a Man program. So imagine that Mitch and I are participants. So they'll get... Tenor, as was mentioned, BAM is a group exercise, we do, uh, group program. We do that just for cost reasons. We're so resource constrained in Chicago, we do it in group. We'd like to do it one-on-one, -on -one. we just don't have the money. 
public policy is all about constrained optimization. So what are you going to do? So 12 kids in a, in a room with a program provider, Mitch and I would be paired up as a, as a group. And uh, every pair would get a rubber ball. And this is called the fist exercise. And so they give Mitch the ball and they would say to each pair, you get 30, Jens, you have 30 seconds to get the ball out of Mitch's hands. Mm -hmm. The only rule is there are no rules, go. So now these are middle school age kids or high school age kids on the south and west sides of Chicago. What do they do? I, most of them, I try and pry Mitch's hands open. That doesn't work. I might break his finger doing that. He won't let go. I start to punch him in the stomach. That doesn't work. I bite his ear. That doesn't work. I put him in a headlock. That doesn't work. Then they call time. Then they switch. They give me the ball. And they'll say, Mitch, you've got to get the, Mitch does the same thing back to me. Now the program provider says, all right, all right, all right. Now let's regroup and debrief. Yes, what strategies did you try to get the ball out of Mitch's hand? Well, I tried to pry his hand open. I might have broken his finger. That's not great. I'm sorry, Mitch. Then I punched him in the stomach. He's tougher than he looks. He didn't give up the ball for that. I bit his ear, which was a little creepy, but I was desperate. That didn't work. I put him in a headlock, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and then the program provider will say, uh, they've done this with thousands of kids in Chicago, now, literally thousands. The program provider will say, Jens, why didn't you just ask him for the ball? <laughs> and like they've literally done this with probably 10,000 kids over the last decade in Chicago. And what the program providers tell me is out of thousands, not more than a dozen ever think to ask for the ball, which is very revealing. And when, when the program provider asked me, why didn't you ask for the ball? I said, well, if I would have asked them, Mitch would have thought I was, uh, and you can imagine what the kids said. Now, the kicker to this exercise then is you can see I've got a system one assumption. If I try and be polite in this environment, Mitch is going to think this bad thing of me. And then the kicker is the program provider turns to Mitch, it, as you anticipated, said, Mitch, what would you have done if Jens had asked you for the ball? And most of the time, the kid in Mitch's position would say, I would have given him, it's a stupid ball. Like, who cares? I would have given it to him. Uh, it's better than having my pinky broken, having this creepy guy bite my ear, <laughs> punch me in the stomach, blah, 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 right? And so you can see it's a very, very clever exercise that gets kids to see that they have these system one assumptions that might normally work well, but can be wrong. And the other thing that I just want to emphasize that's so clever about it is that it is show, not tell, right? Like you get a 15 year old kid and you say, hey, you've got system one assumptions and they can sometimes be wrong, that's useless. But getting two kids to beat the crap out of each other for 30 seconds, to see, like to actually go through this, to have them then think through what they're thinking, for me then to tell you what I was thinking, to, for Mitch to articulate what he was thinking is very, very powerful, right? So it's not just I want it's not just the content, but it's the delivery as well. This is why I say this is not my program, but it's really clever frontline practitioners through trial and error, error have figured out ways of illustrating these ideas to people in, in ways that study. So so I want to follow on to that. Uh, yeah, let's bring the microphone over here. Yeah, please. Yes, I'm uh, Ole Westland uh, from uh, National Council for Crime Prevention. I was I have a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, which person is the easiest to change? Is it the criminal delinquent or the politician? What was the second part of the question? In case you say that the uh, the, the delinquent is easier to change. Uh, mm, why? Who is the grown up? Is it the delinquent or the politician? That's a that's a that's a difficult question. I think I think we'll not weigh in on who's a grown up. Uh, yeah. I think we'll dodge that one. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the the only thing that I would uh, just to to take this seriously, right? So the, the the only thing that I would just say is we have talked about juvenile delinquency and crime here. There's a there's a very serious point that you're that you're making, and it echoes what you said before, which is, you know. The first, I think this, the title of the seminar was Can Behavioral Science Reduce Crime? And I changed that to Can Behavioral Science Help Social Problems? 
because I really do believe we all have a system one, system two. We have all developed these system one responses that normally work well for us. Some of us find ourselves in higher stake situations than others. So it really is just about the random luck of whether you find yourself in a high stake situation where system one gets you into trouble. But there are lots of opportunities in every aspect of life where people system ones are causing trouble in the labor market, in school, in politics, in faculty meetings at the University of Chicago. I have many colleagues I would love to put through the Becoming a Man program. They're much harder to change than politicians even. So I think the larger point that you're raising is exactly right. Like, let us look around at every other problem in society where we could apply this. Yeah, well, it is it is a good question. And uh, I think that uh, your studies show that changing uh, your opinion or changing your behavior is often seen as a weakness. Uh, you should uh, fight back. Uh, and I think that we as a society need to uh, um, let politicians change their uh, opinions. Uh, uh, and we have an, an in real life uh, example right now. I think it's at five o'clock today. We will be members of NATO. And we all know that I was a, a, a fast development of changing uh, standpoints in Sweden. And, and then that was, of course, due to an external factor, uh, the Russian aggression on Ukraine. But still, uh, I think that is, uh, um, I don't regard the, the terrible war, but if we look at, at it as a um, development of uh, politics in Sweden, it's a good example that we can do that. And we also need to allow ourselves to do that. And the question is, uh, should politicians always wait for evidence-based projects or should we try to do something new? Uh, I think that has to do, I usually say that the budget and the legislation, that's the easy part of being a politician. It's the leadership and uh, really managing change. That is uh, the real challenge without being micromanagement. We shouldn't do that. Uh, so. To, that we signal, signalize that, uh, or signal that uh, we do this, but we are uh, ready to change if it doesn't be, give the results we want. But we're all part of the society, so, so we can only, I think, be as good as uh, we, we want and the people allow us to be. Can, can, can I just one, one other non, non-delinquent, non-politics example? Sorry, I'm just yeah. be, I'll, I'll make this very quick. So there was, a, there was a study by Century 21 a few years ago that got published in a journal about um, uh, working with salespeople. So I, I've done a little bit of sales in my life if you've ever been a salesperson. It's a terrible job because 99% of your interactions end up in failures. And most normal people look at that and think um, either the job is impossible or I'm terrible at it. And then you quit or you're, you become demotivated, you don't work very hard and whatever. And, and then there's lots of turnover in those jobs, which is not great for people in the low wage part of it. And what this behavioral science intervention did is it got people to say, to step back and say, what fraction of your colleagues' efforts wind up in successful sales? Oh, they're, they fail 99% of the time too. That's just the job. Don't take it personally when someone says no to you and recognize that there is a 1%, like 99% failure is not 100%, right? So don't give up hope and don't take it personally because everyone's got the same hit rate. Don't give up your motivation, persist in the job, whatever. And that winds up increasing tenure in these jobs, which helps people build productive labor market histories that then let them progress. And it makes them more productive workers. So their sales increase, their earnings increase. So just one small illustration of how these basic sort of system one, system two insights apply throughout society and can, can help address so many different problems. Thank you. So in an eye of these, I'm Marie Pascal. I'm a, a researcher at Sophie at Stockholm University. And I was struck by a lot of examples where you're, that you were giving both of you for the Repulse program, but also the uh, BAM type program. So there's something about also people being there together as groups. And so I'm a bit surprised that almost there's not so much in thinking about how can maybe your peers help you get out of something. 
or, or maybe even thinking within a household, like thinking about siblings, the role of siblings, and how can we maybe try to leverage even more than just the individual per se, but the group, which is not just one person, one person, but there's also the other people around. And how can we maybe, is there any insights on, you know, system one, system two, thinking around these uh, peers who could also help in the process? Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to, would you like to say something about, or? Uh, no, go ahead and answer that. I, I, you have to answer the hard yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, um, uh, what would I say? Like, I think one of the most important, I'm like, yeah, this is guesswork, right? So I don't have data on what I'm about to say, right? But um, my guess would be that one of the most important benefits of the peer structure in um, two benefits from the peer structure and maybe different versions of the same thing, which is like um, nothing that is nothing that is going on with you is unique to you, right? Hearing other people describe, you know, they do role play scenarios. Like, let's um, describe the last argument that you had with someone. Let's role play through this. And so they pick two kids out of this group of twelve, and they role play the argument. And you think, oh, I would have done that dumb thing there too. I can see, right? So it's not just me, it's, and I think also the idea of changing as part of a group is very powerful as well, right? You are in an environment where everybody has learned how to navigate that social environment the same way. When challenged, push back. It does take a lot of personal something, whatever you would wanna call it. Courage maybe would be one word uh, that you could use to really reimagine how you navigate your social environment. And I think to do that with, 11 other kids rather than do it on your own. There's probably some power in that too. But that's a hypothesis, not something that I, I know for sure from doing. Yeah, I would like to make, make a comment. I mean, now we have a very special population, of course, of the children that are placed at CIS. But what what we have experienced is that it's it's really individual if it will work to, to, to work with a group or if you have to, to give them an individual sort of session or treatment. So now we haven't done any evaluations, but I, we, I would think that it's very important to actually ask the, the the youth or or the children to what would work for them actually because there are groups that are not good for each other uh, and there are groups that can really help so it, it, I, I I would say there isn't a, a right answer you have to look at what what group you have in front of you and what the individual needs are terrific thank you hi hi Eduardo San Juanelo is my name uh, Actually, I'm a politician too. So Ulrich and myself, we are from members from the same party. And when I hear the question about the politicians, it brought to my mind that one of the reasons why I participate in this forum is first you were just to learn to get fact, the facts. But in this one, it was very important for me just because we as a politician, we are exposed to very difficult situations in many cases. Because the yeah, the people are expecting much more from us. So that is what I'm thinking with me today is how to respond <laughs> and still be feeling like I'm challenging. I can't take it like that, but just to behave in a better way. So that is uh, the comment I wanted to, to give. Okay. And, and I believe you had a question? Yes. Uh, my name is Susie Kvart. Uh, uh, my question is uh, based on that I'm a, a German, a uh, name of the man in Swedish, uh, uh, and I have some experience of, of the current uh, crime scene uh, in Sweden, is that does your um, experiment with BAM uh, work on more planned crime? We have the current problem in Sweden is that we have uh, a series of bombings and, and, and throwing Molotov cocktails and, and shooting people, but they are planned crimes. They are not... I mean, something coming out from, from uh, system one, uh, uh, it seems to be very much system two. So that, that's my question. Yeah, let me, it's a great, great question. Let me, um, let me say maybe two, two, two things to that very good question. So one response is um, that, you know, every behavior involves a, sequence or a bundle of cognitions, 
And one way to think about this is a system one assumption that you get wrong at any step of the sequence can lead to lots of downstream behaviors going sideways, even downstream behaviors that take place over extended periods of time. And so let, let me give you an example of what I mean, and then I want to say something about robbery, which looks like a, a pre-planned crime as well. But on this point, so um, I have a friend who was a violence interrupter in the US context, and he was describing one gang conflict that he was mediating, okay? So this one gang takes this thing from this other gang, and the other gang is like, you know, that that's not great, but the thing that really pissed us, the, the other gang off, was they start bragging about it on Facebook. And so what the first gang does is they just go through and start killing everybody in that gang one after the other, right? Like the first guy is dead. It was a watch that got stolen, right? One guy dead, second guy dead, third guy dead, fourth guy dead, fifth guy dead. Five guys dead over a watch on Facebook. They call in my friend say, I think we need some help. There are only like 20 other, you know, 20 guys in this gang and a quarter are dead over this thing. So my friend goes to the leader of the gang that's doing the shootings, okay? And um, basically the intervention was, what do you want? That was it. What do you want? Right? And the guy was like, oh, yeah. Like, what, what do I want? Like, do I really want to kill all 20 guys in this gang over this watch? Like, at no point had he, like, system two was very involved in thinking, how are we going to get that third guy? He never comes out of his house. All right, here's what we're going to do. We know that he picks up his kid from child, whatever. Very, very system two to plan to get this guy, how they're going to do it, how they're going to get away with it. But he never revisited this system one assumption of like, what is the objective of all of this? Do I really think that I need to kill 20 guys over this watch? Probably the first guy was enough to send a message for them not to do this again. And for everybody else to learn that you're not going to, I don't need to kill all 20, right? So that's one looks like, and you know, you can see that's people throwing Molotov cocktails into houses and cars and whatever. Is there a system one assumption upstream that, you know, people just never revisited? The other example that I wanted to give was robbery in the U.S. context. So robbery looks like the ultimate premeditated, economically motivated crime on its face. Two things that I wanted to say about robbery. So the first thing I wanted to say is in the U.S. context, half of robberies are done by teenagers. It's the most teenager intensive crime of all the violent crimes. And almost all of those robberies by teens are done in groups. So you can see that there is a lot of peer dynamics going on in those groups as well. And the second thing that I would say with robbery is a lot of the violence involved in robbery is not intended, but rather spur of the moment, if that makes sense. So it's like, we intend to rob you, and then in the moment, something goes sideways and I make a bad decision and I injure you. And you can see some of the behavioral science programs we've done in Chicago, even though they're not giving people money, they produce robberies as well as assaults, which tells you that there's some system one motivation in there somewhere for robbery, even though it looks like it's economically motivated. That's a very helpful answer. Yeah. Yes. Iani, Gunilla, do either of you want to kind of comment from a sort of Swedish perspective? Which well. I would like to just come, not that I have an answer, but just to to say that the planned violence is a big, bigger and bigger problem. And both at the prison and probation service, I believe, uh, and also at CIS, we have, have kids with lots of violence. And what we see is that it's not very reactive. It is planned and instrumental. And that really gives us a headache. I mean, how are we going to to treat that. But that's why this is very fascinating to learn about, about these methods, because that might be a different way to, to at least try to see if that, that might be a way to reach them. Um, because that is a common problem. I think we all share how to, how to handle. So. Yes, that's why I, I say that we have to start early because if we can help them, like you say, um, Jens, uh, we can make them stop 
stop and think one more time before they, uh, because they, they always act on automatic thoughts. And we, in our program, we also have mindfulness practices. So they learn how to slow down before they do what they intend to do. But they are going by automatic thoughts most of the time. And one more thing, yeah, <laughs> yes, the, the, the kids I met, they say, I'm like that. I'm born like that. My father like that. My grandfather is like that. So they don't think they, it's, they are able to change. And that I won't tell them, they, you can, you can. I, I can prove you, like if you give me 10 time, 10, 10, um, 10 times, I promise you that you have, you can change. You can, you're going to see. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm Lise Tom, and uh, thank you, Jenny, for mentioning my name. I'm the one who's going to be, uh, well, the government asked me to try to uh, look at the problems they have at CIS. Um, anyway, my question is, I should say, well, I'm, I'm also a public prosecutor besides, um, this inquiry I'm going to be responsible for. Uh, I have a question about motivation. Um, how do you motivate these juveniles? You were talking about this BAM, which is really, really interesting. And you were giving these examples. I, actually, in leadership programs, I've done just that experiment, <laughs> which is very funny. Uh, even us leaders <laughs> did the same thing, <laughs> fighting before understanding we could do it a lot smarter. Uh, but uh, how do you motivate these teenagers? Uh, because when they're very young, before 12, it's a lot easier. Uh, I know that. But between like 15 and 25, it's really, really difficult to motivate them. How do you even get them to, to go to these BAM program? And is it better to do it in a group like you do? Or is it easier to motivate if they're by themselves? So motivation, and my second question, do you, can you say anything, if it's even adequate for, for the, the American uh, background, um, this culture background? Because in Sweden, uh, the shock we have here is these vendange, uh, between these vendettas we have between those groups. That's a bit odd for the Swedish culture, because we haven't had that before, or, or we had many, many years ago. But this is very uh, relevant right now, just like somebody said from the courts, uh, Nemdemam, who talked about that. But vengeance, uh, and they don't want to discuss. They, they don't have this older person who tells, let's, let's do some peace here. No, they don't have that. So those two questions, motivation and cultural background. Could you say something about that? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, maybe. So uh, one thing that's super important for motivation is that the programs themselves are show not tell. A second thing that is we've seen is really uh, anecdotally very helpful for motivation is that the program providers come from the same background as the kids. And so part of what that does is it helps the kids see, this goes back to your point, like mm -hmm. I, I am on an inevitable trajectory is what a lot of kids say. And when you have a program provider that grew up in your exact same neighborhood in your exact circumstance, and they were the third generation of the black disciples or the gangster disciples or the you know, the trigger happy family or whatever it is. And then they see a program provider saying, my life is totally different now. I've got a $60,000 a year job and a college degree, whatever. That really resonates. And the final thing I'll just say is like, sometimes for the, for the really high risk people who are most hardest to reach, there are two strategies that we found that, that work. And one is to invest a lot into carrots to get people into the program. Either a very intensive mentor who lets the kid know, like a 24-7 mentor who's always available, let the kid know that they care about them. Very expensive, but really helpful in bringing the kid is. Or a job, where the job, it's a subsidized job, and, and one of the conditions of the job is that you participate in the programming as well. Also very expensive, but also drives kids in. That's not going to work with everyone. That's why I've become a super big believer in, in really, like, the thing that I've become religious about is... Um, Let's incorporate these behavioral science principles in schools and in detention facilities where we have captive audiences, right? And you cannot tell me that every second of every day in Sweden in school and in detention facility is optimized already, right? 
There is a lot of wasted time in schools and detention facilities that you can easily repurpose with ex existing staff and the kids to make it much more helpful to, uh, to kids. That's the low hanging at scale fruit here. Ginny, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I would also like to comment on how to work with motivation, because I think that is mainly what we do at CIS. Um, the success of our treatments is that it includes motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy. So that means that we teach uh, how to... Um, you well how you can, how you uh, how you the way you think will affect how you feel but it will also affect your behavior and vice versa you can alter one of those three and get a different result and that's very uh, it's a very important strategy and i also think that part of of actually enhancing someone's internal motivation is to get a sense of coherence the, the children that we meet uh, don't have that when they come to us. Uh, they're all over the place and they need just a safe place to land. And when you have all the stabilizing factors like <laughs> regular sleep and, and uh, food and daily structures, that's when you also can start working on comprehensibility, manageability and meaningfulness. And that's the way how to build up the motivation to actually ch make, a, make a change. That's terrific. Thank you. Ulrika? Well, as a member of the parliament and I have a large majority behind me, I say that we, of course, we also have to go after the guns, the explosives. We have to have a general and situational interventional prevention work. Uh, we have been able to reduce the amounts of like bank robberies due to better safety. Uh, we don't steal as many cars in Sweden uh, as we used to because they're not that easy to steal. Uh, now we have frauds against elderly. Literally, I think the lot of solution is that the banks need to make that impossible. So uh, just and also uh, the police, they are very much more focused towards the leaders of the gangs nowadays. So I just wanted to add those pieces into this discussion as well. That but uh, motivational interviewing, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, we from the public sector, we work with that in like healthcare when it comes to stop smoking, uh, obesity, and other things. So I think that uh, your research and this with behavioral science is, is gonna help our society in many areas. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. And we're going to take one last question, and then everyone's going to be outside for coffee uh, and cake, so you'll have the opportunity to ask more questions then. Hi. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Lena Adamson, Associate Professor of Psychology, Stockholm University. I have a question regarding your program, Repulse. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I understand, there are uh, no RCTs done on it, there are no follow-up studies, and uh, why not? Um, my experience is that... Um, uh, programs that are based on just uh, conventional wisdom can fool you a lot. I think one of the worst examples I've heard, I don't know if you remember it, Jens, I'm a lot older than you, uh, is the Scared Straight program, which after the follow-up uh, turned out that I think on every $1 spent, I think it cost $50 or something like that because it actually fostered criminality. Uh, so uh, my experience here in Sweden is also that we do not do the RCTs. We do we 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 just go ahead and think of something we think is good, but we do not follow up. So back to my question: Did I misunderstand, or is there any studies done on it? And if not, why not? I answer on why not because from the beginning it was an individual program, and you can't start a program if you don't. If the kids don't say yes, because they have to be motivated. We don't work with people who say we don't want. I can't treat no, a person who don't want to be treated. So I first I have to motivate this person. And um, that's why it has been very hard to... to, um, to um, uh, Evaluate. Evaluate the program. So for the first 10 years, I, I asked a lot of um, researchers, but they say, we can't, who are we going to compare it to? Because if one is saying yes, are we taking someone who say no? And how do we do that? 
So that's why. But now, because we see that it's so many kids who need this uh, knowledge, we also started working with classes. And now it's easier. And now we have started one study. So I hope it's going to be uh, better. But I think it's for, if I started in 1998 and we haven't done any commercial, it's just been spread from mouth to mouth because uh, the, um, the um, network saw the change. And after every, it's 10 sessions. After the 10th session, the, the people the, the people has to evaluate what they think about it. And we had, we had gathered about 7,500 evaluations. And it says that they pleased and they have got uh, help from it. That's what, that's the only thing we have right now. That's excellent. Thank mm. you. So we can we can continue that conversation afterwards. Mm. Uh, before you continue the conversation over coffee, over cake, uh, I just want to remind you that there's an upcoming SNS uh, report launch on the topic of uh, prevention in healthcare, and that'll be Tuesday of next week. And so, if you're interested, you can go to the SNS website or scan the QR code if you can scan a giant QR code. And uh, there's coffee and cake, uh, and please feel free to ask the panelists further questions.